December 8th, 1980, I was assigned to the 20th precinct. Uh, I was a patrolman in a radio car, and I got a call that there were shots fired at 1 West 72nd Street. Uh, there was a man pointing, and he said, doing the shooting. And at that point, we realized this is for real. So I peeked in and saw a man with his hands up. So I threw this guy up against the wall. And at that point, Jose says to me, he shot John Lennon. And I said, you what? Ovo je umjetničko dijelo udovice Johna Lennona, Yoko Ono. I was thinking about all these windows in the world, and there's so many windows that have uh, uh, bullet marks, you know, bullet holes. So I wanted to make a symbolic gesture of one bullet hole for that. And also, you have to see it from the front, and you have to see it from the back, because when you see it from the front, you're the shooter. When you see it from the back, you're the victim. And I did it, and then I saw it and said, oh my God, I saw that, that night. U ponedjeljak 8. prosinca 1980. u 10.50 na večer, John Lennon ubijen je ispred zgrade Dakota u New Yorku. Late this evening, one of the world's great entertainers and musicians, John Lennon of the Beatles, was shot outside his New York home. Ubojstvo Johna Lennona šokiralo je cijeli svijet. Switched on the radio and imagine was playing. You know, it was like a, a knife through your heart, you knew it was true. It was a shattering blow. Stunned. I just couldn't. I said, he, I just saw him. Total shock. Absol uh, absolute shock. I could not believe it. I mean, I, I was shocked, and then I'm saying to myself, who did this? And why anyone would, would hurt John? Then, then it, it struck me that I might have a picture of the killer. U siječnju 1969. 11 godina prije Johnove smrti, Beatlesi su održali svoj posljednji koncert na krovu svoje uredske zgrade u Seven Row. Bio je to kraj jedne ere. John Lennon snažno je utjecao na cijelu jednu generaciju, a i šire. I don't know much what happened there. I wasn't born on that, but yeah, man, the gig, man, the last gig and that. Don't let me down. I see this arch, McCartney there, isn't it? Lennon in the middle, Addison there, cool. Isn't it? I mean, it was his voice, man. I mean, it makes me happy, makes me sad, makes me fucking angry, makes me chill, you know what I mean? It's his voice, really. I thought, right, I want to be in a band like that. What kind of make music like that? Cijelog svog života, nakon što je napustio Beatlese, John je bježao od ludosti Beatlemanije. 1971. našao je utočište u New Yorku, gradu u kojem će devet godina poslije biti ubijen. Yeah, the last time I saw John, we were in Madison Square Garden. He said, uh, I can walk down the street, walk through the park, people pass me, hi John, and keep on walking. Instead of, hi John, oh, hold your breath please, blah, 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 blah. He said, I love it. And I thought to myself, John's found peace at last. <laughs> Mir je imao svoju cijenu. Johnov politički aktivizam utjecao je na mlade, te ga je i sam predsjednik vidio kao prijetnju. Nixon je John odlučio uskratiti zelenu kartu. There is a piece of tape somewhere of Nixon's henchman saying, you know, this guy could uh, sway an election. This is preserved. And the first step was to kick him out. And they were very eager to do that. 
U kolovoz 1980. John je već odavno dobio bitku za pravo boravka i zajedno s Joko kreće u novi glazbeni projekt. Ovdje su snimljeni kako odlaze iz grade Dakota prvog dana snimanja svojeg albuma Double Fantasy. Nisu mogli znati da će im to biti zadnji album. Njihov koproducent Jack Douglas. The idea of this album was a play, a dialogue between a man and his wife. A man who had been through the 60s. It was about, well here we are, we're turning 40 and everything's okay. We can still do this. We can still have our voice. We managed to make it through all those terrible years. And now let's look to the future. U rujnu 1980. album Double Fantasy je pred završetkom. I listened to it very intently. I saw the smile come on his face and he, he yelled out, Mother, tell him we have a record. Majka je bio njegov nadimak za Joko. He made me laugh all the time. I wasn't trying to make him laugh, but it seemed like he was laughing all the time about me. Just the fact that I'm saying something serious. Said, you're so tiny and you're saying these things, and you know, that made, made him feel funny, I suppose. John je bio ljubazan prema svojim obožavateljima. U studenome 1980. obožavatelj koji će poslije zadnji snimiti Johna Živoga dobio je prvu priliku za fotografiju. So he says, well, let's take it now. Let's get it the hell over with. You never know if we'll get another chance to do it. And this was 21 days before he gets murdered. So, I, I mean, I was like a kid, you know, under the Christmas tree on Christmas morning. And when I stood next to him, John put his right arm around my shoulder. And I couldn't believe that he pulled me to him. And when he did that, it gave me the idea and I held on to his fur collar. Because I was holding it almost to make sure it wasn't a dream, like he wasn't going to disappear on me. Najpoznatiju sliku Johna Lennona u New Yorku snimio je njegov prijatelj, fotograf Bob Gruen. 5. prosinca, tri dana prije nego što je ubijen, John ga je nazvao. He was in a good mood, he was very playful. The next day he asked me to come back because he had gotten a new jacket and he wanted some pictures in the new jacket, a very fancy Yamamoto jacket. And so we stayed up all night talking that night while they were working in the studio. And it wasn't until dawn that we actually were out on the street Saturday morning, I think that was December 6th, and took a bunch of pictures there. And that was the last time I saw him there. Te subote, 6. prosinca, John je dao radijski intervju Andyu Peeblesu, Dish Jockeyu BBC-a, u studiju Hit Factory-a na Manhattanu. And there was my hero. I remember he immediately put his arm around my shoulder and said, thank you for coming. And I felt like saying, what do you mean, thank you for coming? When I left England, I still couldn't go on the street. It was still Carnaby Street and all that stuff was going on. We couldn't walk around the block, couldn't go to a restaurant, unless you wanted to go with the business of the star going to the restaurant garbage. I can go right out this door now and go in a restaurant. Do you want to know how great that is? And towards the end of the interview, for some perverse reason, it just flashed through my mind, ask him about security. And he came out with the classic quote, you know, I can walk down the street and people say, hi, John, how are you? How's the baby? And I can see him now saying it with such conviction. He could never, ever have dreamt what would ensue in 48 hours. Never, ever have dreamt. Ponedjeljak, 8. prosinca 1980. U deset ujutro John Lennon izlazi iz grade Dakota i kreće prema svom omiljenom lokalnom brijaču. He just wanted a haircut. I don't know, maybe I I have those hairs still. I don't know. I used to keep his hair. Well, the day started with uh, Anne Libovic's photograph. Nakon što je fotografkinja Annie Libovic završila fotografsku seansu za časopis Rolling Stone, njezina će naslovnica postati slavna u cijelom svijetu. Johnov obožavatelj fotografa mater Paul Goreš stiže kao i obično. I got to the Dakota around 11.45 in the morning. And when I got there, it was, it was a nice mild day. It was for December 8th. The only other person there was a, a guy standing with a long overcoat with a fur collar and a fur hat. 
and he had a scarf on, and he was holding double fantasy under his elbow. And uh, he says to me, are you waiting for Lennon? And uh, I said, yeah. And uh, he said, my name's Mark, I'm from Hawaii. And I said, I'm Paul, I'm from New Jersey. And he said, oh. He said, you work for him? I said, no. And he said, uh, I came all the way from Hawaii to get my album signed. So I said, where are you staying while you're in the city? And with that, he seemed to change his whole demeanor from like a, 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 a dope to an aggressive person. And he said, why do you want to know? And, and I told him, go back where you were standing and leave me alone. And uh, we would, um, we were doing this sort of, uh, the interview. It was RKO uh, radio, was it, you know? 12 sati i 40 minuta. Ekipa s radija RKO u San Francisca puna očekivanja stiže na intervju. We drive up to the Dakota, which is a very impressive building. I mean, it, it's, it takes your breath away. And then we're uh, ushered into uh, this incredible space, uh, this beautiful room where you take your shoes off, which is a wonderful custom, sit down on a couch. And Yoko was there, and uh, I noticed, I looked up at the ceiling and I saw this beautiful these clouds that were painted on, you know, lovely. U međuvremenu, Paul Goresh ulazi kako bi uzeo Johnovu knjigu iz 1965. A Spaniard in the Works, koji je ostavio Johnu da mu napiše posvetu. John was coming into the hall. He said, I'll sign it for you today, I promise. So I went back outside at my post, and uh, when I went back outside, the guy with the overcoat was there, and he was alone, again, on the other side of the archway. And he came over to me and he said, uh, you know, I, I want to apologize to you. He said, I owe you an apology for the way I acted. He said, but you're in New York. You never know who you can trust these days. Ponedeljak, 8. prosinca 1980. Jedan sat i 25 minuta. John Lennon počinje dvojposatni intervju s radijskim novinarom Davom Šolinom. Biće to njegov posljednji intervju. The door opens and John appears, does this little jump, jumps up in the air and you know, proceeds to like say, here I am folks, you know, the show's ready to begin. He spreads his arms out and comes right over. He could not have been more upbeat. U intervju John govori o svojem životu, o vremenu kad je živio u Liverpoolu, o vezi s Joko i o njihovom sinu Šonu. He was born on October the 9th, which I was, so we're almost like twins. So now I have a sort of more reason to stay healthy and bright. People say I'm crazy. Doing what I... In 1979, around then, he was saying, you know, I feel very lonely because there's not a man that I can talk to. Uh, of being a house husband or being in a position of understanding about women and all that. And they must have some kind of, you know, a group session or something with those men. So I said, well, I suppose there should be, but I, I, we couldn't find one. And one day I saw John sitting in bed and crying. And I said, what happened? And he was reading a book called The First Sex and it's a book about how women did not get credit at all for what they did in history. And he said, I didn't know that we were doing this to women. So he has a very soft heart, you know. It seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that John came from a background that was very macho. Very macho. Oh, I was surprised. But you know, I think that was normal in those days for guys. Ovo je klub u Liverpoolu gdje se John nalazio s prijateljima iz škole primjenjene umjetnosti. Među njima je bila i Thelma Pickles. Ona imala 16 godina, a on 17. Well, a romance, I suppose it was, in its way, a useful romance. John je živio ovdje u kući koju su zvali Mandips sa svojom tetom Mimi, kojega je odgajala umjesto njegove majke Julie. Well, 
got up to the kind of things that young people get up to. He had a very pristine bedroom. And he once told me, or asked me, did I know that making love, you expended the same amount of energy as going for a five mile run, which I didn't know. And I don't know to this day is true, but I believed him. Um, and then it became a euphemism. Jedne večeri održavala se zabava u školi primjenjene umjetnosti koje su oboje pohađali. And he said, come on, let's go for a five, a five mile run. So we went upstairs to the art history classroom. When we got inside, there were at least three other couples. And uh, I didn't realize at first. And then I said, I'm not staying here. And he absolutely whacked me one. And I didn't speak to him. After that, I wasn't, I didn't care who he was, how interesting he was, how funny he was, how caring he was, how lovely he was. I was not going to be hit by a lad and continue a relationship. Johnove veze sa ženama često su bile kontroverzne. 1970. već je bio jedan od najpoznatijih ljudi na svijetu. Njegov rani brak sa Sintijom, s kojom je imao sina Giuliana, propao je. No, Joko je bila omražena. The reasons for the Beatles splitting up and so on were, with precious little evidence, uh, ascribed to her. Neprijateljstvo prema Joko nije se smanjilo ni kad su se preselili u New York. I felt terrible about me, but then I was feeling guilty about him, that, you know, he was really getting it as well. Because his records were not selling too well either. And it's all because he was with me in a way, you know. Because we were together almost 26 hours a day. And I think it was very, very unusual for John to be like that. And also any rockers, you know, they just kind of sneak out or something. There was none, none of that because he was worried that I might do it. <laughs> he was laughing about it. Said, well, because, you know, I'm an artist and, you know, he felt that, you know, I might be more sort of free about things, you know, unlike other women. So, and probably I was, but I wasn't that free about that sort of thing. Zapravo je zbog Johnove nepodopštine s drugom ženom na jednoj zabavi 1973. Joko odlučila da trebaju neko vrijeme provisti odvojeno. I call it my last weekend, it lasted 18 months when the feminist side of me died slightly and she said, get the hell out. <laughs> Give me 30 seconds to just um, be in the space. Elliot Mintz je novinar iz Los Angelesa koji se sprijatelio s Johnom i Yoko. Yoko thought it would be best for John to go off on his own and for the two of them to part as a separation. And she suggested he leave New York and go to Los Angeles. That choice was... Uh, partially uh, based upon the fact that I was here and that somehow I might be able to look after him. Talk about a burden. This is calm, it's gonna get you. In the first couple of weeks, he did what people do in this city. If you're uh, a bachelor for the first time and by former profession, you happen to have been a beetle. He liked the action. For a short time, he liked the parties. He liked the nightclubs. He liked the drinking. He didn't mind the attention of the ladies. I can tell you this. A week, two, or three into the experience, the only thing he wanted was to figure out a way of getting back with Yoko. And I would say to uh, Yoko, look, he, he just keeps saying to me, uh, tell mother, he referred to Yoko as mother, tell mother uh, that I'm ready to come home. And I would say that to Yoko, and Yoko would say, no, he isn't. I'll let you know when he is. Nakon 18 mjeseci odvojena života, John i Yoko su obnovili vezu. Tada, 1975. rodio se njegov sin Sean. John je bio novi čovjek. S 
svoj povijesni intervju s Daveom Šolinom 8. prosinca završava tvrdnjom da osjeća kako ulazi u novu životnu fazu. Because I always consider my work one piece, whether it be with Beatles, David Bowie, Elton John, Yoko Ono, and I consider that my work won't be finished until I'm dead and buried, and I hope that's a long, long time. So we ended this interview, uh, said our goodbyes, all took photos. I had my photo taken with, with John and Yoko, which I treasure more than anything. Wrapped up the gear and then headed on down to, uh, to get to our car. To, we were going right to the airport. Četiri su sata i blizu ulaza još se mota obožavatelji fotografa mater Paul Goreš. Spazio je ekipu s radija RKO u kako izlazi iz grade s opremom za snimanje. Now a little bustle, people starts coming out, I start noticing a lot of silver cases and whatnot, so I figured John will be coming out soon. Next thing, John uh, comes walking out looking for a car that was uh, going to take he and Yoko over to the record plant. So he turned to Jose and he said, uh, Jose, where's my car? And he said, it's, Jose was the, the night doorman who had come on. His name is Jose Perdomo. And he said, it's not here yet, Mr. Lennon. He's looking around. And I thought it was, for, for a split second, I'm thinking to myself, boy, this is pretty amazing. I mean, here's John Lennon outside of New York. I thought of that quickly, and I said, I just dismissed it. In this town, it's no big deal, and that was it. He said to me, don't forget to get your book. He said, did you get your album signed? I said, I'll get it. I'll get my album signed tomorrow. I'll get the book before I leave. And as he was talking to me, the guy with the overcoat approached him from the left. And uh, he didn't say a word. He just held the album out in front of John. And John turned to him and looked at the album and said, do you want it signed? And the guy nodded. He didn't say a word. He just nodded. So it looked like a picture, so I snapped a couple pictures. And uh, the first picture I took was John signing the album, looking at the album. And he nodded, and he took the album, and he just backed away. So John is saying, well, our car isn't here. You're going to the airport. Yeah, would you, would you mind giving us a ride? Hop on in. We're headed in the same direction. So as he was getting into the limousine, I, I took a picture of him getting into the limousine. And, and uh, that turned out to be the last picture of my life. He got in the limousine and he was facing me. And as it was pulling away, John looked out the window and waved to me and smiled. And I waved goodbye to him. And, and, and I would never see him again. Sada je pet sati, ponedjeljak, 8. prosinca 1980. Novinar vozi Johna Lennona u studio i usput ga pita kakav je njegov odnos s Polom i Kartnijem. He says, well, he's like a brother. I love him, families, we have our, we certainly have our ups and downs and quarrels, but at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, I would do anything for him, I think he would do that for me, and that was where it was left. So that was great to hear. And we dropped John and Yoko off at the studio, said our goodbyes. Dok su John i Yoko snimali u studiju, nekoliko ulica dalje u Central Parku, mladi novinara sa ABC-a doživio je nesreću na motociklu. On će imati ključnu ulogu te večeri. Cops came, ambulance came from St. Luke's Roosevelt. And I remember riding in the ambulance and one of the EMTs said, you're lucky, it's a Monday night, it's quiet. Um, as a doctor at the uh, ER, she's a young lady, you're going to love her. She's friendly and, and easygoing, and they're going to take you one, two, three. U studiju, John i Yoko su dovršavali zadnju pjesmu koju će ikad snimiti. Njezi naslov imaće simbolično značenje. So the last thing we did was to record Walking on Thin Ice. It's still hard for me to talk, well, you know, to think about it because it's a song that just came to me. But when you listen to the song, it's about us, you know, and how we will be remembered or not be remembered when we are 
be turned into ashes. Why was I thinking that? And it's really weird. And uh, John loved that song, and he said, Yoko, this is your first number one. I think you just got your first number one, Yoko. We finished the mix that night, and I, I walked him down to the elevator, um, and I said to him, I'll see you uh, at Sterling, the mastering house, at 9 a.m. And, uh, and he was all smiles and thrilled and had a cassette of the song with him, and Yoko was all smiles, and um, the elevator door closed. Zadnji glazba koji je John snimio bila je dionica gitare za ovu pjesmu. And then when we were in the car, 